this is a story of a crooked cop who framed an innocent person and then she sat in jail wrongfully for two years. I mean, is that a fair characterization? Uh, a St. Paul police officer named Heather Waker uh, began in 2008 a sex trafficking investigation that essentially she just made up. Um, the Department of Justice has a conviction rate over 99%. And in this case, ultimately 33 people were charged with federal crimes and not a single one of them was convicted or took a plea deal. Um, and so this was just a spectacular failure um, for the federal government via its use of this cross-deputized St. Paul officer named Heather Waker, who framed a bunch of people, my client included. I was put in jail for 17 months because an officer lied about me. And has thus far completely gotten away scot-free with it. Right now, she's still a sergeant in the St. Paul Police Department. She's still employed, making six figures. In fact, she was recently sued again in her capacity as a St. Paul cop. I'm a coach. I originally became a police officer to try and stop domestic violence and try to make a difference in some of the victims' lives. Being a mom myself and, and having several kids, it's, it's, you can kind of look at things in kind of a different perspective and um, we bring a caring, nurturing flavor to a scene. I think you should come to St. Paul Police Department and work with all the great officers here. We're all supportive of each other and we treat each other like family. Welcome back to the Civil Rights Lawyer Channel. This is the most insane case that you have never heard about. That was St. Paul, Minnesota police officer Heather Waker. The U.S. Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals held that this police officer had likely fabricated a non-existent child sex trafficking ring and apparently falsified testimony in court and to a grand jury. This led to the false arrest of 30 Somali refugees, some of whom spent years in federal prison, including the Institute for Justice's client here, Hamdi Mohammed. This is absolutely insane, and she, there's been no accountability. There have been no successful lawsuits against her, and she's still working there in St. Paul. As you can see, those promotional um, clips from their YouTube channel were filmed after a federal court had found that she is a liar. But it's not over yet. There's still a pending lawsuit against this corrupt police officer. I have Patrick Giacomo, an attorney with the Institute for Justice, who has returned to the channel to discuss this case, to discuss the crazy facts, and to discuss why this case is so important for government accountability and for our constitutional rights, and to tell you how you can help because your help is needed. Well, your money is needed, and you also need to help us and help the IJ get this story out there take a look. Uh, a St. Paul police officer named Heather Waker uh, began in 2008 a sex trafficking investigation that essentially she just made up and over the course of several years eventually was able to indict about 30 people, almost all of them Somali refugees, um, in this big scheme um, that she claimed had to do with human trafficking. Although 30 people were indicted by uh, federal prosecutors in Tennessee, um, interestingly, not federal prosecutors in Minnesota who refused to take the case. The few that actually made it to trial were eventually acquitted by the Sixth Circuit. And in something I've never seen before, we got a Sixth Circuit opinion affirming um, the acquittals that basically said, we've done a painstaking review of the case and the case history. And we found instances of this officer, Heather Waker, lying repeatedly. And we have come to the conclusion that what we're about to describe in our opinion here is a likely fictitious story of sex trafficking. That all fell apart completely. In 2011, Hamdi and two of her friends ended up being attacked by a third or by a fourth girl named Muna Abdul Qadir. And unbeknownst to Hamdi and her friends, Muna was one of the secret witnesses that Heather Waker had been using to fabricate this crime ring that she would later be prosecuting. When Muna attacked the girls with a knife, they called 911, and Muna took off and hid in a neighbor's apartment, and she called Heather Waker. Now, Heather was concerned because Muna was a key witness for her, and so to protect Muna and make sure she didn't get arrested, what Heather Waker did was call up the on-scene officers via their car computers because she's, again, a St. Paul cop 
these are Minneapolis cops. And so she understands the local practices. They get a notice saying to call Officer Heather Waker out of St. Paul immediately, which they do. And when they call her, she feeds them a line of lies about how what actually happened here was that Hamdi and her friends were seeking to intimidate a federal witness. And so the police on the scene should arrest them instead of arresting Muna abdul Qadir. And that's exactly what does happen. The three girls were arrested for witness tampering under Minnesota law. Then the next day, Officer Waker swears out an affidavit in support of federal charges and has all three of these girls charged with witness tampering under federal law, uh, charges that carry the potential of life in prison. Hamdi and one of her other friends spent about two years in federal prison waiting for trial. Um, ultimately, the charges against Hamdi were dropped, but her friends Hawo and Ifra were both tried and both acquitted in the federal system. And so um, just to zoom out on the likelihood of all of this kind of just being chance and not Heather Waker's malfeasance putting almost 33 people in prison. The Department of Justice has a conviction rate over 99%. And in this case, ultimately 33 people were charged with federal crimes and not a single one of them was convicted or took a plea deal. Um, and so this was just a spectacular failure for the federal government via its use of this cross-deputized St. Paul officer named Heather Waker, who framed a bunch of people, my client included, and has thus far completely gotten away scot-free with it. Right now, she's still a sergeant in the St. Paul Police Department. She's still employed, making six figures. In fact, she was recently sued again in her capacity as a St. Paul cop for tricking her way into a man's apartment um, without a warrant to search it. And in that case, the federal court granted summary judgment against her. The trick in this case, and all of these cases that came after Heather Waker was found out, is that what they have done is the sort of two-step uh, immunity shuffle where they've said, first, give me qualified immunity. The courts have routinely tossed that out. In fact, the way the Eighth Circuit put it when it rejected her claim in the case of Hamdi and her friends was any reasonable officer would know that lying to have another officer arrest an innocent person to protect a sham investigation is unlawful. So that kind of gives you a flavor for the sort of contempt that the courts have had for um, Heather Waker's behavior. But to get out of any accountability, what she's done instead is say, I was cross deputized as a U.S. Marshal. And so you can only sue me as a federal officer. And as a federal officer, there's no Bivens left because my case isn't exactly like Webster Bivens's case. And therefore, I can't be sued at all. And so far, she's won on these theories. Hamdi's case is the last case standing. And the issue that we're now advancing is, even if she was acting in some federal capacity as a cross-deputized officer, she was also acting under color of state law and can be subject to liability under Section 1983 because, of course, she is and was a St. Paul police officer. And a variety of other facts support the fact that when she did what she did here against Hamdi and her friends, she was acting at least in the simultaneously as a state officer and a federal officer. And the added wrinkle here is in Hamdi's friend Ifra's case, this 1983 issue has already been decided by the Eighth Circuit. And they concluded based on the facts in Ifra's complaint that Officer Waker was acting exclusively under color of federal law. So when this case came back down after the Supreme Court declined to grant review on the issue of Bivens in Hamdi's case, we kind of thought you know, we'll be stuck with the same facts that Ifra's case had. But as it turned out, we found some rather crucial documents pertaining to several task forces um, that are relevant to Heather Waker's behavior. The first of which is a task force called the Gerald D. Vick Task Force, um, which we have found out since then and have sought to amend our complaint to put this before the court is a St. Paul-led task force explicitly in the documents. It says this is a St. Paul-led task force uh, with the purpose of stopping human trafficking in Minnesota. And Heather Waker's entire investigation, the one that she was trying to cover up for when she had Hamdi and her friends arrested, was a St. Paul investigation undertaken through this Vic task force and through which Heather Waker had always been supported in some capacity by federal officers, proving that the federal component of what happened here didn't somehow take this out of the space of Section 1983, but instead just showed that the federal officers were cooperating to support Heather Waker's investigation. And the other two documents which we found 
are documents from other task forces because something I should also point out, there's been no discovery in this case or to my knowledge, any of the other cases against Heather Waker because the government has been so successful in having them dismissed so quickly. We found other um, memoranda of understanding for task forces between the St. Paul Police Department and the FBI. So that's Heather Waker's employer on the one hand and the sponsor for her federal marshalship on the other. And those documents specifically say if officers are sued for constitutional violations, federal officers are sued under Bivens and state and cross deputized officers are to be sued under Section 1983. And so now we have this whole new nucleus of facts that prove that Heather Waker was acting under color of state law. And the government is fighting like hell to prevent us from amending the complaint and simultaneously asking the district court to dismiss the case um, without really even digging into it any further. I, I think there have been more than 20 lawsuits against Heather Waker, um, a bunch of them from the 30, uh, some of the 30 people who she charged in the sex trafficking case. And then Hamdi and both of her friends filed separate civil rights lawsuits alleging Bivens and Section 1983 claims against um, Officer Waker. And just by weird happenstance, I mean, this is all in front of the same district court and, this, and of course, the same circuit court. Um, just by happenstance, um, Hamdi's case was consolidated with her friend Hawos. And the issue there was the Bivens issue, whether this officer could be sued under Bivens. Um, and the Eighth Circuit said, you can't sue her under Bivens, but explicitly they said, but that doesn't mean the case is over. If you can prove she was acting under color of state law, you may be able to proceed under Section 1983. In regards to the your client, uh, Hamdi Mohammed. This is a story of a crooked cop who framed an innocent person and then she sat in jail wrongfully for two years. I mean, is that a fair characterization? Absolutely. So this is a crooked cop who framed three innocent girls who were teenagers at the time. And Hamdi was actually a minor. And these are people who are already coming from um, a difficult background. They're all three Somali refugees who came to this country under refugee status. So they don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of connections. And doing this to them completely derailed all of their lives. And so ever since then, despite you know being let out of prison, um, they've gotten no remedy for the violation of their rights to be able to get their lives back on the right track. Meanwhile, this crooked cop is still out there violating people's rights and being paid by the taxpayers of St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, my first question, after I read the second amended complaint and I read some of the, the other documents that you guys had posted on the website, my first question to you was going to be, what happened to this Heather Weicker? What happened to this crooked cop? And it sounds yeah. like nothing. Yeah, so uh, what happened was nothing criminally. All of the civil rights lawsuits, like I said, so far have stalled out on some form of immunity or another. And uh, the, the police department opened an internal investigation against her, which they just kept open for years and years and years and used as a way to stonewall providing information. And then fairly recently just closed that investigation without any sort of finding of, of wrongdoing uh, against Heather Waker. And so, like I said, she's still employed by the St. Paul Police Department. Um, she's now a sergeant. She makes six figures. Um, and even still, she is behaving like she's above the law. An interesting thing about Officer Waker is, you know, if you type her name into Westlaw, there are a number of cases outside of this case, like I mentioned, where courts have called into question uh, the truthfulness of things she said. In fact, there was a state case where I think the Minnesota Court of Appeals had a dissent where the, the, the judge described Heather Waker's telling of what happened in the back of a squad car um, with a very sarcastic tone in his disbelief of what she said happened, where this guy had his hands handcuffed and somehow was able to get his keys out of his pocket and provide them and along with them consent to search um, something. Yeah, I, ju I just Googled her name, you know, Officer Weicker, Minnesota. And the first thing that came up is a New York Times article. If the police lie, should they be should they be held liable? But isn't that crazy? I mean, all right, Minnesota contrast the George Floyd case with this case. Yeah, and this is, you know, I part and parcel with our other work, for instance, in King versus Brownback and several other cases is, is what we've seen is, and, and something that's very under reported and, and not well understood is this proliferation of these state federal task forces. 
um, which which is which is bad in its own right, I think, because it essentially has allowed the federal government to become the local police wherever you live, you know, including the Twin Cities, including Grand Rapids, Michigan, including basically everywhere in the country. Now you have these task force task forces staffed by federal officers with the FBI or the U.S. Marshals or ICE or you name it. And then some combination of local officers who are often cross deputized with a single piece of paper that now says, well, I'm also a federal marshal, too. What we've seen is not only do these allow this expanded authority where the feds can act under state law and the state officers can act under federal law. And so they've doubled the authority that they have and they can go places that they couldn't go before. But because the courts have cracked down on the availability of Bivens, the government has also figured out that by cross deputizing these officers, you can essentially immunize them above and beyond qualified immunity. And so you'll see situations where like this one portrays, the officer is denied qualified immunity. So you're able to get past that enormous hurdle, but they're still immune from suit via federal immunity because there's no Bivens cause of action against them, according to the courts. Even though, again, we're talking about a state or local police officer the exact sort of person that Congress enacted Section 1983 to cover. And you just have this sort of federal Midas touch now that that places them above the law and above the Constitution. And that's what this case is really about. How do you best explain to somebody or a lay person why you can sue right under the current state of affairs? Why can you sue a state or local police officer um, for civil rights violation, but you cannot sue a federal officer? Yeah, I don't think there's a good explanation. Um, we've seen uh, Judge Don Willett in another IJ case actually called Bird versus Lamb, where a DHS agent tried to murder our client, um, Kevin Bird, for asking questions about the DHS agent's son's involvement in a drunken crash the night before. There, again, like this case, the officer was denied qualified immunity, but it went to the Fifth Circuit and they said there's no cause of action under Bivens, and so you simply can't sue this guy at all. And uh, Judge Willett concurred because they had to follow circuit precedent. And he said, look, this situation doesn't make any sense to me as a federal judge or just as an American person. And the fact that you can sue state and local officers under a federal statute, but you can't sue federal officers for violating the federal constitution smacks of self-dealing by Congress. And it's something that I think should be addressed and should be taken care of because obviously, before you know, the 14th Amendment was passed, the federal constitution only applied to federal officers. But now today, it seems it doesn't apply to them at all. And, and you know, it's especially, uh, this is an especially difficult topic today with all the discussion of weaponizing the federal government. And I'm afraid that a lot of people in Congress are sort of missing the point. They're concerned about weaponizing the government. They wanna do something about it. The easy solution is to add four words to Section 1983 and include federal officers um, in the sort of civil rights liability space that their state and local equivalents already exist in. And then we can fight about whether qualified immunity should protect any of these individuals. How did this client, um, Hamdi, find her way to the Institute for Justice? And I mean, how did that I know so many people have so many problems. Logistically, how did that happen that she ended up getting you guys to help her? Yeah, this was a case that we found after the Eighth Circuit's decision. And so we reached out to Hamdi's attorneys, um, Hawa's attorneys, and Ifra's attorneys, um, just because what we saw happening here was so egregious and was such uh, a terrifying illustration of this task force immunity loophole that we've seen expanding and expanding. Um, and, and that's where things started. I mean, how is it possible that the, the federal courts have denied qualified immunity to this woman and made findings that she had intentionally violated people's civil rights and been responsible for all this, and she's still working with, I mean, is she on some sort of Brady list? I mean, <laughs> Uh, you know, I have I have no idea. Uh, I actually wondered that myself. She has to be. You know, I, I would think she has to be on the do not call list or the Jiglio list or whatever they call it in Minnesota, because you can imagine, you know, being a criminal defense attorney and Googling Heather Waker and you just instantly have the perfect impeachment evidence that you could ever hope for. Um, and so I, I don't understand. At last I knew she was working at like a library or something. So that led me to believe that she was on some sort of, you know, list. 
But then we found this case that is still, you know, technically going forward where she had broken into someone's apartment under false pretenses and searched it without a warrant. Um, so she's obviously still out there on the street doing normal policing. And, and to your point, I don't see how that's possible when it comes to actually pursuing charges via prosecution, because, you know, who would believe this woman at this point? Unless there was just no disclosure and the, the defense <laughs> lawyers working on her cases, just don't Google her name. Yeah, I, I don't know what I can do about that. I mean, the New York Times article seems like it would be enough. Uh, the Star Tribune has done excellent reporting on um, Waker's malfeasance in this case. Uh, so so I'm, I, I don't know. But I, I, that's, you know, that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse. How was the how was the truth discovered? Like like that there was this that she had framed all these people or at least framed Hamdi. Yeah, so um, it, it was discovered basically when everything started falling apart in these cases, and and people just started, you know, pushing kind of ever so gently on the the theory because as you know, um, all of these cases, the investigation starts, the indictment begins. Um, the charges are brought, and all of that is done exclusively on the word of the government and the government's agents. And so up to that point, everyone takes that word as gospel. And so if you go back and look in the newspaper records, which is actually great, things we quote in our amended complaint are drawn from these things. There's all these glowing stories about Heather Waker way back then. It was like, you know, how, how a local cop cracked this giant sex trafficking ring. And everything is framed around like this woman is a hero. And how did she save all these young girls who are being sex trafficked and and these terrible gang members? How did she manage to infiltrate the system? And as we know now, most, if not all of that stuff was completely made up, but it took the adversarial process to push back and cross-examination and just question asking by the federal courts at the most basic level. Um, and once that happened, everything completely fell apart and um, the charges all fell apart. Some of them were dismissed. I can't for the life of me understand why some of them were still pursued. Why, for instance, Hawo and Ifra had to go through criminal trials. Um, but, but that's what happened. So what's the status of Hamdi's case right now? Um, right now we are all briefed up on our motion to amend, which of course the government is vigorously um, opposing. Um, it's the biggest, it's the most paper I've ever spent on a motion to amend I, this, the government's argument is essentially about futility. We have a 30 plus page reply brief. Meanwhile, in parallel, the government has moved to dismiss the case on the old complaint, which is kind of, you know, strange. Um, but that's all briefed up as well. And so now we're just sort of sitting, waiting to see whether the district court will set a hearing date or multiple hearing dates. Um, and then we'll see what happens going forward, um, whether they allow us to amend. And then we go through another process of, of briefing on another motion to dismiss or for summary judgment, um, or whether they throw the whole case out just because they're tired of dealing with this for the last almost decade now. Um, and then there'll be an appeals process. And this is being defended by the DOJ? Yes, this is being defended by the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., being paid for by the federal taxpayer's dollar. So all of and us, really, a, I mean, you and I are paying to defend Heather Waker <laughs> in, in some extremely dark way. Um, you and I are, are the money that we make while, def, you know, while litigating on behalf of Hamdi Muhammad and people like her um, is being taxed and that money is being paid to defend Heather Waker. So the, the goal is to get into discovery and then ultimately to a jury trial, but there's been a, a lot of paperwork and there's going to continue to be a lot of paperwork because they're fighting this so hard. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this that's the crazy thing about all these sorts of immunities is um, essentially the courts treat them as a, an immunity from suit, not an immunity from liability. And so they're very vigilant about making sure that cases don't go to discovery if there's a possibility of immunity. and the result is that instead of just going through discovery for six to nine months, then having a trial and having the jury weigh the facts and be done with this stuff in like a year, year and a half, you spend a decade litigating at every level of the federal system, filing probably about a thousand pages of briefing at this point. Um, and the system is just much less efficient. It takes much longer. 
everyone is still tied up. Like this lawsuit has been going on against Heather Waker. And so presumably she's having to disclose it on things in her life. Obviously Hamdi and, and her friends have been dealing with this for such a long time. And the ostensible reason is that it would be too burdensome to put Heather Waker through discovery, which just doesn't, you know, two and two does not add up here when the alternative is decades of litigation, which is what we're seeing in, in most of these cases, which of course, as you know, gives a huge piece of leverage to the government in all these cases, because, you know, civil rights, you know, thankfully at the Institute for Justice, we're a nonprofit. And so we're not motivated by the potential settlement value or a jury value and getting a contingency fee or anything like that. But if you are, the prospect of one of these cases taking a decade is something that a lot of private attorneys just aren't set up to deal with. And so it gives the government this enormous stick to beat plaintiffs with. that will say, look, you can try to sue us. Even if you could win, it'll take you 10 years. Good luck finding a lawyer who's willing to, to put all the effort in to do that. And so I think a lot of the cases are cases we never even see because no one bothers finding a lawyer. If they, if they try to, they can't. Um, and plenty of attorneys won't take these cases at all. If you had to guess, how many hours do you think uh, IJ attorneys have, including yourself, have into this particular case? Oh, a, a thousand at least by now. Um, it's this. I mean, it, this is like di these are difficult issues. How can people help? Um, now, you guys obviously take donations. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, uh, we take donations. We are a five hundred one c three nonprofit <laughs> charity. All the work we do is completely free to our clients. Uh, we'll never charge them a penny. If we win their case, we don't take a contingency fee. Um, so everything we do is, is dependent on the generosity of our thousands and thousands of individual donors. Um, and so if you wanna help cases like Hamdi's, and there are many other types of cases, and, and the Institute for Justice does other work in the space of property rights and economic liberty and the Fourth Amendment, and lots of other very interesting um, constitutional issues. You can go to ij.org and you can donate there. You can set up a monthly donation. There's no donation too big or too small. Um, everything is very much appreciated and completely needed to do these things because like we were just discussing, um, it's very expensive to you know, have attorneys on staff and pay all the filing fees and travel all across the country to do what you need to do to meet clients and go to hearings and try to gather evidence. Um, and so we rely on those donations to make sure that we can stay in these fights for as long as it takes to see them through to the end and to help people like Hamdi Muhammad, who never in a million years could pay an, an attorney's hourly rate to help her for, for something like this. And so it's, it's incredibly important and we're so thankful to get to do this job and help people like Hamdi and her friend Ifra um, because of the generosity of donors. So if you go to ij.org, um, you can donate um, and, and it would really help um, IJ keep to keep doing things like this for people like Hamdi Muhammad and our many, many other clients. How is Hamdi doing now? Um, she, uh, to be honest with you, she has been one of the more traumatized clients I've had. And as you know, John, you know, my practice involves uh, plaintiffs who've almost all gone through something extremely traumatic, whether that's being physically beaten or imprisoned or something terrifying. And frankly, something that thankfully most of us will never have to um, encounter in our lifetimes. Um, and so she's doing well, all things considered, but I, I, this is absolutely left an indelible mark on her life emotionally and psychologically, in addition to completely stunting her ability to move forward and have, you know, a successful career or an education, things like that. And so Hamdi is a sweet, lovely woman. Um, she's a mother. Um, I think she's very charming, but you can talk to her and immediately know that this is something that will stay with her for the rest of her life. And, and, it, and to me, it really says something because, you know, she came from a traumatic background experience fleeing war um, in Somalia. And to have this thing be the kind of main trauma in her life is really shocking. Um, and I think it, 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 it's especially, um, it's, it's especially sad to see as a foil, like, what happened to this refugee from another country who fled was so traumatic 
that she found out in the United States of America, um, the place that's supposed to provide all this promise and all this freedom and all these rights, that this kind of thing can happen to you. And there's almost nothing you can do to stop it. And even after it's done, there's almost nothing you can do to get any accountability and enforce the rights that are promised to you under the American Constitution. This is a tragic story that I think people need to hear about. And it, it does illustrate the fact that we, we, we don't have equal justice under the law. And th there probably are countries in Africa that have a more fair judicial system than we have when it comes to civil rights violations. I mean, it's, it's just insane. Well, hopefully she gets her day in court and hopefully officer Weicker gets her day in court as well and gets, gets held accountable. But you're right. That's the system that we live in. And, you know, that's why the Institute for justice exists and we will keep um, banging on the door until they let us in on these issues, because fundamentally we know um, on a basic first principles level that someone like Hamdi Muhammad deserves her day in court and someone like Heather Waker deserves to be held accountable for what she's done. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we're supposed to do is protect the most vulnerable among us. I mean, that should be our job. And then what does the government do? It attacks the most vulnerable. It attacks the, 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 not the hard targets usually, but the weaker targets and really an atrocious case. And I, I really thank you guys for taking it on. And I wish I had been following this sooner, but, um, you know, I really want to encourage anybody who has the ability to, to, to donate and I'll put the link in the, well, it's already in my description permanently as I always try to get people to donate to you guys, but, uh, hopefully we can raise some money here with, with this video and, and bring some light to what's happening. Yeah. We don't have any, we don't have any salacious video footage of what happened or anything like that, but we have some salacious um, court orders and, you know, that illustrate that here you have a crooked cop took somebody who was vulnerable uh, among us already and just put her in prison for two years. And there's no accountability at all. And you guys are still fighting for accountability if things go your way in court, you're still going to get to put that officer under oath and take her deposition, ultimately put her before a, a jury and try to get at least a money award for, for Hamdi. So um, this is something where people can donate and spread the word, and it really, really will help. Yeah, thank you so much, John, and thank you, everybody out there, um, for just for listening, because these stories often go unheard. All right, Patrick. Well, it's always a pleasure. I, I appreciate it. Um, I know you're you're busy, so I'll let you go. Um, hopefully we can talk again soon on some other atrocious uh, case of injustice involving our government. <laughs> yeah, sadly, there is no there's no bottom of the list. All right. Fascinating conversation. In case you couldn't tell, Patrick is one of the top civil rights lawyers in the country. Again, he's with the Institute for Justice, and you may have seen a donation link for them in my usual description on, on all my videos, and that's because they do such great work. If you want to help and you don't know how you can help, that is how you can help. You can donate money to the IJ and keep civil rights lawyers like Patrick busy suing the government 24-7, 365 days a year. So this case, as he said, is important because not only do you, we already have to get over qualified immunity, but now police officers have found a, a loophole for liability where they just act as a, as a federal task force. And now if they're, if they're seen as a federal officer, in addition to being a state or local officer, you can't even sue them at all under section 1983. So that's why it's imperative that they win this case and the other cases that they're working on. So I urge you to please donate to them. Some of the videos I've done about their cases in the past have been very successful at raising thousands of dollars for their cause. So show them the power of the YouTube audience and go to the donation link right now. And whatever you have, if it's a dollar, just donate, um, donate what you can to help. So as always, thanks for watching. And uh, I look forward to doing some more videos with the Institute for Justice in the near future. They have a lot of exciting cases that I'm excited to tell you about. Remember, freedom is scary. Deal with it. Thank you.